on this Friday night on High Alert. Mounting fears Iran could exact revenge on Israel in just hours. The American president's warning to Iran. Don't. And what's being done in hopes of deterring an attack. Ottawa's ambitious plan to solve Canada's housing crisis. What's needed to make it a reality and how long it might take to see any results. Round two with the interference inquiry. My recollection is, is the same as previous statements. Why Canada's spy chief had to testify again. And protecting bears hey, get. from a persistent threat. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening. There are ominous signs tonight of an imminent attack on Israel. The U.S. believes a direct strike from Iran could be just hours away. And American President Joe Biden has a stern warning. Don't. We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel. And Iran will not succeed. Iran says it's planning to retaliate for an Israeli strike nearly two weeks ago that killed seven Iranian commanders. Today, dozens of missiles were fired toward Israel from Lebanon, where the powerful Hezbollah militia is based. Israel and Hezbollah, the oldest and best trained Iranian proxy group in the Middle East, have been exchanging fire for nearly five months. Now, all eyes are on Iran, and its response will determine the trajectory of this conflict. Will its retaliation be measured or an even fiercer counterstrike that could trigger a wider regional war? Jackson Prosco has been tracking developments and, of course, so are American intelligence officials. Jackson, what are we hearing? Farah, the White House has made it clear it believes a strike could come within the next 48 hours. American intelligence officials expect Iran could hit targets within Israel using ballistic missiles and one-way drones. Israel convened its war cabinet and says it's preparing for multiple scenarios. The big unknown is what Iran's response will actually look like. Will it be large and direct, or could Iran do something smaller, perhaps launched by its proxies in Iraq, Syria, or Lebanon, something that sends a message without triggering a wider response? The U.S. has made it clear it will stand with Israel if Iran launches an attack. The Pentagon has moved additional warships and aircraft to the region, both as a deterrent and a precaution, fearing this could all spiral out of control quickly. The move to strike the embassy annex of the Iranians was an extremely provocative move. So I think we can see any number of things happening in the very near future that have a impact that might result in a regional conflagration, if not affect the entire world. Behind the scenes, there seems to be a last-minute effort to contain the situation. Through back channels, Iran has reportedly warned the U.S. to stay out of any conflict with Israel or risk having American troops in the region come under attack. The U.S. is said to have told the Israelis to consult with Washington before responding to whatever Iran does next. Tonight, the U.S. is telling its own diplomats to restrict their movements within Israel. The U.K. has urged its citizens to leave the country. And Canadian citizens are urged to avoid all travel to Iran and all non-essential travel to Israel. Farah? Okay, Jackson Prosco in Washington, thank you for that. There was a serious security situation today in a Palestinian village in the West Bank. A group of Israeli settlers, you can see some of them wearing black headscarves, stormed the village, setting homes and cars ablaze. Yash Dean, an Israeli human rights group, says the settlers were searching for a missing 14-year-old boy. One Palestinian was shot and killed in the attack. 25 others were injured. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society said one of its ambulances came under fire as it was responding to the incident. Israel is responding to concerns about a car and a UNICEF aid convoy coming under fire in Gaza on Tuesday. The vehicle was in a busy holding area near an Israeli checkpoint. UNICEF workers were on an approved mission to deliver supplies to northern Gaza. Israel says an operational examination has determined its defense forces did not shoot at the vehicle. Israel says it appears that the IDF forces who were closest to the area were not within firing range of the convoy at the time and place indicated. And it was found that no fire was carried out at the vehicle by IDF forces. Israel says the humanitarian effort in Gaza is a central part of the IDF's operational activity and it tries to prevent harm to humanitarian teams. The federal government is sending around $132 million of assistance funds to Sudan. 
as it struggles a year into its devastating civil war. And around 100 million of that will go into funding humanitarian efforts there. We're working not only with large organizations, we're also working with smaller groups that are nimble, that have local knowledge and, and local credibility. We're using every tool possible to make sure that we respond to this crisis effectively. The news comes as the World Health Organization warns the country is in dire need of more aid. They say between 70 and 80 percent of Sudan's health facilities are out of commission, while 15 million people need urgent health assistance and around 5 million are on the brink of famine. Ahead of next week's federal budget, Ottawa unveiled what the housing minister labeled an ambitious strategy to tackle Canada's housing crisis. The Liberals' plan builds on previous pledges while promoting new tax incentives and loosening zoning laws to make homes more available and affordable. According to a report released Thursday by the Parliamentary Budget Officer, Canada needs 3.1 million homes by 2030 to close the housing gap. The Prime Minister says the Liberals will build almost 3.9 million homes by 2031. But as Mackenzie Gray reports, that all hinges on provincial buy-in, which isn't going to plan. Francesco, buongiorno. A jovial liberal front bench outlining their crystallized housing pitch. Our goal is that no Canadian pays more than 30% of their income towards their home. To do that, the Prime Minister putting out a 26-page proposal with a litany of old and plenty of new policies, including tax changes to increase purpose-built rentals, a new energy retrofit program for low- and medium-income homeowners, and new rules to crack down on mortgage fraud. Because Canadians need homes they can afford. This is one of the most urgent issues that people are facing. In all, the Liberals proposing 53 different policies ahead of next week's federal budget, but many of them require provincial buy-in. Ontario already rejecting core demands from Ottawa around mandating looser zoning rules. If the provinces don't want to do it, that just means there's more money to go directly to the municipalities. But that soon might not be legal in Alberta, with Premier Danielle Smith proposing a new law requiring provincial approval of any federal municipal agreement. My message to Ottawa is that federal politicians and the Prime Minister in particular should do his job and stop trying to do my job. One thing missing from Trudeau's plan, his signature housing pitch from the 2021 election, banning blind bidding when purchasing a home. The housing minister saying they're not implementing it because the market's cooled off. The circumstances that would justify that kind of a policy have not necessarily been as apparent uh, today as a result of the dynamic that exists in the economy as it did maybe a few years ago. The Liberals might wish it was a few years ago when they look at the polls. Despite the hyper-focus on housing, the Conservatives are now 20 points ahead of the government, the largest gap yet. The Prime Minister and the federal government have been the villains in this story, and I think they are trying to change that by making it clear they're putting money on the table. But that money won't lead to immediate results. Housing experts say it takes at least two years before government policy changes the housing market far up, and that's well after the next election. Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thanks, Mackenzie. The head of Canada's spy agency, CSIS, appeared for a second time at the inquiry into foreign interference. David Vigneault was not scheduled as the last witness. That was supposed to be Justin Trudeau. But the top spy was called back after the prime minister's closest advisor said CSIS did not relay key information related to Chinese interference in the last two federal elections. Taria Isri reports. I just want to ask you what your recollection of that meeting is. The CSIS boss uh, back before you. the same uh, inquiry, yeah, but with uh, a different focus, defending his name and his agency's work. Director of CSIS, Mr. David Vigneault, and he's been recalled to testify. To David Vigneault was called before the commission for a second time on whether he fully briefed the prime minister and his inner circle about the threat of Chinese interference. This is something that uh, I have absolutely said a number of times, again, in, in public and in, uh, in private. The Prime Minister's closest advisers testified earlier this week that Vigneault briefed them in February 2023, but left key information out. 
His declassified talking points say we know that the People's Republic of China clandestinely and deceptively interfered in both the 2019 and 2021 general elections. Conclusions Trudeau's staffers say were not passed on to them. Most of what was in that document was not relayed to us in that meeting. Another briefing note, this one from 2022, says Canada has been slower than our Five Eyes intelligence allies to respond to the four an interference threat. We have never heard language uh, like the stuff that are that is in this uh, in this document. Vigneault pushed back, saying even if he did not read his notes word for word, the contents should come as no surprise. I can uh, say with, with confidence that uh, this is something that has been conveyed to uh, to the government, to ministers, the prime minister. In his testimony Wednesday, the Prime Minister suggested CSIS may not understand the nuances of the electoral process. But Vigneault left the inquiry with this final thought. Intelligence is a little bit like a puzzle. Sometimes we have a very clear uh, picture of, of, the, uh, of, uh, of uh, the puzzle. It's now up to the inquiry commissioner to review the hours of testimony, hundreds of documents and a trove of top secret material with her interim report on foreign interference due in less than a month. Farah? Taria Isri in Ottawa. Thank you, Taria. Some sad news today. Canadian-born journalist Robert McNeil, the creator and first anchor of PBS's NewsHour Nightly News in the 1970s, has died. Born in Montreal but raised in Halifax, Robert McNeil went on to become a respected and hard-hitting reporter and then anchor, winning every major broadcast journalism award in America. He co-anchored the McNeil Lair NewsHour for almost two decades alongside his late partner, Jim Lair. Robert McNeil built his career on solid journalism and good writing, always steering away from sensational gotcha-style interviews. His daughter Allison confirmed the death, saying her father died of natural causes at a hospital in New York City today. Robert McNeil was 93. Canada's opioid epidemic behind bars. Coming up, how the crisis is plaguing the prison system. The opioid epidemic has gripped Canada for nearly eight years now, and the prison system is no exception. Nearly one quarter of federal inmates are receiving treatment for opioid addiction. Now, this creates its own challenges in the prison system, both administratively and in trying to rehabilitate people. David Baxter explains. When people lack hope, that's when they use substances more. The opioid epidemic does not stop at prison walls in Canada, where nearly one in four federal inmates are receiving opioid agonist treatments like methadone or suboxone. This has advocates like independent Senator Kim Pate calling for increased supports to help prisoners who are struggling with addiction. If people are engaged in programs, if they have regular access to visits, they are far less likely to be involved in any kind of drug activity, illegal or otherwise. As of February 4th, 3,129 of Canada's more than 13,000 federal inmates were receiving some form of opioid agonist treatment. That's 23% of the federal prison population. This is more than triple the rate of inmates receiving OAT in 2016 when the opioid crisis really began to take off, when just 9% were receiving the treatment. Both the health authorities, community, uh, prison services were, were quite challenged with the rapid increase on, on patients that uh, ended up being on a opioid use disorder. At its peak, the wait list for treatment was over 400 people, but now it's in the 90s. The prison guard union says they do see some issues with the program, including instances of diversion of prescribed medication. When we're monitoring those inmates, when you have 100 of them in the institution on a given day, operationally in the morning to get that routine done is a nightmare. I've been a correctional officer for 21 years and I've never seen this amount of uh, drugs inside of our prison walls and fences. Uh, the, uh, the crisis is, uh, is alarming. Correctional Service Canada does offer mental health services for inmates, but Pate says much of the psychiatry resources are spent on risk assessments. She argues there needs to be a greater shift of focus on reintegrating people into society. Whenever we relegate people who are suffering with addictions, especially when it's linked to past trauma, to prison, we're basically reinforcing and increasing the risks to them in terms of their inability to be in the community. David Baxter, Global News, Ottawa. 
protecting culture ahead. The calls for Canada to secure a sacred Indigenous site. From Neapolitan pizza to Belgian beer to Arabic coffee, the United Nations Intangible Cultural Heritage List safeguards globally cherished traditions. And the list has more than 700 recognized entries, ranging from reggae in Jamaica to yoga in India. And it also recognizes lesser known traditions like blacksmithing in Armenia and the culture around the French baguette. Now, Canada has not signed on to the United Nations Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. And as Neetu Garcha reports, many Indigenous advocates want that to change. In the heart of BC's interior lies a piece of history etched in stone, a symbol of resilience passed down through generations. That particular rock that kind of brings that story together, but it's that uh, hardships we did have with our, or our neighbours back in the day, we did have big wars. Chief Frank Antoine of Bonaparte First Nation shares the significance of balancing rock. And the contest was to put that rock on that land. He says the sacred site is a testament to the battles and victories of his people. Hey, he -ho -ho. And he pays tribute to it by singing the honor song. He says it's critical this knowledge, drumming and singing continue to be passed down through generations. He -ho -ho -ho. But he says, especially with the legacy of colonialism, it's a struggle to preserve these pieces of intangible cultural heritage. I think the struggle for me is when being a chief and when you work with the government system, it's basically who owns it. There's a winner and a loser, and that should never be in our language. It's not how we, it's not how we work as people. Chief Antoine emphasizes the importance of collaboration and sharing knowledge, a sentiment echoed by Karen Aird, whose work centers around protecting culture. It's everything that defines us as Indigenous people. It's also incredibly vital for the wellness and survival of Indigenous people. Aird highlights the value of intangible heritage, from the intricate knitting in these Cowichan sweaters to the raven burials in ceremonies. There were two fully intact ravens that were buried at different parts of the cave, almost a thousand years apart, but in the exact same location. But Aird says without support and elevation through initiatives like UNESCO's Intangible Cultural Heritage List and government funding, the preservation efforts face challenges. Especially with COVID, we've lost a lot of our, our elders and knowledge keepers, which are our libraries. In a statement, Canadian Heritage reaffirmed its dedication to protecting intangible cultural heritage, emphasizing local initiatives and preservation funding, despite Canada's non-membership in the 2003 UNESCO Convention and no plans to consider it. Indigenous culture and heritage has never received the same funding and support as settler or Western heritage. I want to honour my people, I want to honour my nation, and I want to honour all the other nations that are here. It's not about me. When I sing this honor song, hey, yo, oh, the fight to preserve these intangible treasures continues with hopes for a future where safeguarding cultural heritage is unquestioned. Neetu Garcha, Global News, near Kamloops, BC. Bear versus train. Next, the measure is being taken to protect grizzlies in Alberta. An Alberta filmmaker recently captured two of the province's most famous grizzlies on camera, including one of the bear's close calls with a train. As Heather Yurks West explains, the video highlights a long-standing threat to the safety of these majestic animals. It was a lucky encounter for Canmore's Andy Arts. In early April, he came across a stunning grizzly bear. I was out filming. Uh, all sorts of things and I came across him on the tracks and I was like, ah! But the bear in this video is special. And if you're from this area or if you frequent Banff National Park, you might even know him by name. Split Lip is one of the valley's most famous grizzlies. Uh, we were watching him for probably about 20 minutes and then suddenly I heard this noise. Onlookers watched for several seconds as the train approached, but Split Lip doesn't move. That's a train. Hey! Come on! Hey! Get! There you go. <laughs> 
As the train sounds its whistle, the bear saunters away with seconds to spare. That was cool. I was so close. A close call highlighting a persistent threat. The footage was captured along Highway 1A between Castle Junction and Lake Louise. Since 2000, researchers say 20 to 25 grizzly bears have been struck by trains in Banff and Yoho National Park. But we know that they're attracted to grain. We know that they eat grain. And we know that a lot of grain is spilled. A CP Rail spokesperson says deploying the train's whistle, as seen in the video, is just one of several ways the company works to prevent bear deaths. Quite a few things have been done. Uh, CP has replaced a lot of their grain cars so that the frequency of grain cars that leak is lower than it was uh, 15 years ago. Still, bears have learned to return to this food source each spring. A week before filming Split Lip, Andy captured another well-known grizzly, the boss, feasting at the same spot. Luckily, no train that time. Heather Urex West, Global News, Canmore, Alberta. And before we say goodnight, a final salute to a man who spent a lifetime following in the footsteps of a Canadian hero. 44 years ago today, Terry Fox began his Marathon of Hope. And for 43 of those years, Montreal's Eddie Nolan participated in Terry Fox Runs. Today was his final one. You're amazing, Eddie. We love you. The 67-year-old took a lap around the floor of the hospital where he picked today to leave the world by medically assisted death. Nolan was diagnosed with throat and neck cancer more than a decade ago. He passed away peacefully this afternoon with his wife Mary by his side. Nolan raised $1 million for cancer research. And tonight we end with his words. Be kind, it costs nothing. Peace and love to all. Eddie, good night.